Okay, so we're um, we're still at this section here, and I'm working my way through uh, this second set of slides. So a lot of last week was about uh, the role of these hook functions in React, and they essentially allow us to manipulate a component's state and a component's life cycle. And what we kind of know now about a component's life cycle is that it goes through the following sort of uh, sequence of uh, phases, if you like. The component is mounted, we say. That means it's actually contributing something to what's being displayed on the screen. The component then may re-render many times uh, while it is mounted, uh, again, triggered usually by the user interaction, or it could be as a result of a side effect. Each re-rendering of a component may cause that component to change what it contributes to the screen. Uh, maybe as a result of some other event that occurs in the browser, the component will unmount and effectively then that means whatever it was contributing to what was being displayed is now gone. Later on, it may remount again, uh, go through re-renderings, unmount, remount, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's a component's life cycle. That's what I mean by its life cycle. And uh, these hook functions, two of them we've looked at, they're all about essentially a kind of affecting a component's life cycle and also manipulating state. And we know what state is now at this stage. So um, I'm gonna pick up the story. So, so the, uh, the kind of second half of the second lecture last week, I talked my way through this a version of our sample app and this particular version had two side effects and three state variables and I explained the workings of the app and as I said then and I repeat again it's really important now that you do spend the time just playing around with this sample app to make sure you understand how side effect works and how sorry the use effect hook works uh, in particular the use state uh, is more straightforward, I think. So I'm going to push on from there. Uh, th this was the hierarchy, just before I do move off from it. This was the component hierarchy of our sample app one. We have two versions of it now, um, but it, it, it uh, essentially had this as its component hierarchy and all that was fine. Just in case there are any questions, maybe people have had time to play around with the app since or rewatch the videos. Uh, are there any questions I wonder in relation to this particular app? Uh, no, it's grand so far. Okay, so we move on to back to data flow. Uh, I talked about one of React's data flow patterns called the unidirectional data flow. Now there is a second pattern called the there's two names for it actually. The one that I like is called the data down action up pattern. Its other name is the inverse data flow pattern, which I don't like because that kind of gives the impression that the unidirectional data flow is being kind of violated in some way. So whichever we call it anyway, uh, or whatever name you come across when you read about React, uh, I try and refer to it as the data down action up pattern. And where this pattern arises is if you've got this issue here, I'm saying, what if a component's state, you know, it has a state variable, but that component state is influenced by an event in a subordinate component. So there's a component further down the hierarchy uh, and there's some user, inter user interaction with that component. And it's that interaction that needs to be communicated to a stateful component, which is higher up the hierarchy, to tell it you need to change the state, uh, the value of one of your state variables. Okay, 
that has not arisen so far. So far, what we've had is we've had stateful components, but the user interaction that triggers the change in that state, that user interaction was actually managed by that stateful component itself. That's not arising in this case now. The, the user event is being managed by another component further down the hierarchy. And the solution to this, uh, and it arises uh, a lot, is the stated down action of pattern. So again, we're going to stick with this simple little app as our illustration, but I'm calling this now my sample app two. So it's a different code base now from, uh, and you get it in the exact same place. So if you go to uh, this archive here and zip it, etc., then you will find the sample app two folder. The sample app one was what we were talking about last week. Uh, again, just import that into VS Code, npm install, npm start. And it, it's, it actually, from a user's perspective, it, it does the exact same thing as sample app one. The difference though is in how it's designed from a component hierarchy point of view. And this is the new design. So I've got a new component over here on the left called search box. And as the arrow is telling us, that search box component is going to be responsible for managing the user input in this case. Uh, it's managing the text box. Previously, the text box was being managed by this component here. So this is still the stateful component. This is still the component that is going to be um, uh, recording the current value of the text box, but it's this component down here is going to be res responsible for reacting to the user typing something into the text box. So this one needs to communicate back up to this one the fact that the user has changed the text box. Okay, um, other than that, uh, this is the same as before, and this is the same as before. So how do we code this guy and how does this compute component kind of, how do they interact with each other? What actually happens as we see in the code in the next slide is that this component here is going to pass as a prop, a function down to this one, a function reference really. It's going to pass a function reference down to this component. And when the user types something into the text box, this component is going to invoke that function that was passed down to it. Okay, so it now arises uh, that uh, the function that's being the function reference that's being passed down is going to be done via this prop uh, vehicle. So a prop can be data, or it could actually be a function reference. And I'm going to show you just some excerpts from the code. So again, the the pattern solution is as I'm saying there. Um, Okay, and here are some excerpts from the code. Here's my stateful component at the top of the hierarchy. So all of this is the same as before, but here I've got a local little function and you can see what it's doing is it's changing the state variable, the state variable up here. But that function reference is being passed down as a prop to this new component called search box. Search box then, uh, here we have it down here. Uh, there isn't a whole lot in it, but in the search box component, that's where we have our text box. Our text box, and we have an on, uh, an on change handler with our text box, which we've seen before. Uh, it's referring to a local function here, but that local function, you can see what it's doing is it's actually invoking the callback function that was passed down as a prop to it by uh, the component on the right. And it's also, I mean, the arguments, uh, the parameters can be anything you want them to be, but sensibly what we are passing as a parameter essentially back up to the component on the right is the new value of the text box. And so here we are up here, it takes the new value and it calls the uh, state setter method with that new value. And that triggers the uh, re-rendering of this component, et cetera, et cetera. 
Okay, uh, just pause for a second in case there are any questions on that. And you will see this happening quite a lot now in the movies app. So the new uh, discovery is that a, a prop can be more than just data, it could actually be a function reference. You will never have the case, if I just go back to the previous, you will never have the case where you have a stateful, a stateful component down here, let's say in the hierarchy, and there's a component further up in the hierarchy that is influencing the state of the component further down. That will never arise. I'm not going to go into why that's the case, but just take it from me. It won't arise. So that's uh, sample app two. And again, um, you can play around with it uh, yourselves just to make sure you understand the pattern and the flow of control. Now, the last thing I want to talk about in this section is something called the virtual DOM. We know what the DOM is. It's this data structure that's maintained internally in the browser and the browser uses it to determine what should be displayed on the screen. We know that anytime we programmatically change the DOM in the browser, then immediately uh, the browser will react to that and it will update what it's painting on the screen. I did mention in passing uh, in the, one of my earlier lectures that you know there are, there are actually lots of good practices and bad practices which people have learned over the years as to what uh, what type of operations you should avoid carrying out in the DOM, what type of operations you should perform in a slightly different way, all with the intent of improving the user's experience. What we don't want is to have uh, slow updates to the DOM and hence a slow refresh of what's being painted on the screen. We don't want that kind of uh, latency. So, you know, as I said, over the years, in the very early days of browser-based apps, uh, people just had to learn what, what to avoid in terms of DOM manipulation or what, were, what was the right way uh, of updating the DOM. And I'm just listing some of them here, but there were many, many more. Now, what the React team kind of decided or asked themselves when they were designing the, uh, the framework was, should we actually expect developers to have all of the knowledge necessary in terms of what they should and should not be doing in terms of DOM manipulation. And they came to the conclusion that perhaps they shouldn't expect the developers to have all of that knowledge. So they took that responsibility away from the developer. And the solution they came up with is something called the virtual DOM. The virtual DOM is a mirror of, we'll make a distinction now between the virtual DOM and the real DOM. The real DOM is the DOM that's actually the browser itself uses. The virtual DOM is a mirror of that, but it's actually managed by the React framework itself. And there are many differences between the virtual DOM as a data structure from a data structure design point of view and the browser's DOM from a data structure's design point of view in that the virtual DOM is a much more efficient data structure. The browser's DOM and the real DOM has been around for a very long while, and it's still quite a clumsy, uh, inefficient, arguably, data structure design. So uh, when we write React code and our component and our, our, our components go through a re-rendering and the entire app goes through a re-rendering, we are never directly manipulating the real DOM. We are actually manipulating the virtual DOM and React then steps in and it looks at what changes have happened to the virtual DOM and it decides what operations to carry out on the real DOM. And it obviously does it in a much more efficient way than we would do it programmatically ourselves. And that was one of the kind of the sweet spots of React at the time. So, uh, I'm kind of trying to document here how exactly React kind of works in a very general sense. 
So I'm saying that what React does when it kind of loads your app into the browser initially is it creates this, this virtual DOM, which I'm calling a lightweight efficient form of the real DOM. It actually constructs that itself. And then uh, when your app, uh, when your app goes through re-rendering of various components, those re-renderings uh, are reflected in the virtual DOM. It, it uh, React updates the virtual DOM structure. And then it computes uh, it computes a diff operation between the new virtual DOM and the previous virtual DOM. So it kind of has two copies, the before and after uh, copies of the virtual DOM. Every time your, your component hierarchy goes to a re-rendering sequence, it now has the kind of before and after state of the virtual DOM. It carries out a diff operation between those two. That tells us what changes need to be carried out on the real DOM, and it carries out those operations on the real DOM as a kind of a batch update, uh, which I'm saying down here. So that's kind of how what happens every time you, for some reason, are every time your app goes through some sort of state change. You know, one of the components is its its state uh, changes. That component re-renders all its children re-render. Um, every time that happens, React goes through this diffing operation and computing the difference between the, the new and the old and up, batch updating the real DOM. It's doing all that for you. The result is that, that your React code is much cleaner. If we had to write our own real DOM manipulation code, and I think I've mentioned this before, it would be very long-winded, very spaghetti-like, very difficult to structure it. Uh, but all of that now is is gone as a result of the React kind of programming model. And the changes that are being carried out on the browser's real DOM is optimized for you. So if we go back to the very simple counter component that we had way, way back when I introduced stateful components, all of this stuff here now is closed in kind of red. This is all done by... React. So when the user clicks the button on that component, the onClick handler ran, as you know, it changed the component's state variable. And once that happened, the component re-rendered, the component itself re-executed or re-rendered. That meant there was some change made to the virtual DOM. React did its diff operation, and then it batch updated the, the DOM, as I said. Here's a more detailed uh, step-by-step -step explanation of what actually happens. This is in the context of our, our which one is it? The, 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 the filtered friends app that we were looking at today and, and last week. So when the user types something into the text box, uh, an event handler deals with that. It makes a state change. And now React goes through all of this again. Uh, we uh, we use the term pre-commit when 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 React um, computes the difference between the new virtual DOM and the previous virtual DOM. We we refer to that as the pre-commit phase that React that the React engine goes through, as in it has not committed any changes to the the browser's real DOM yet. And then the commit phase is when it actually applies changes to the browser's real DOM. And after it has applied changes to the real DOM, then the browser uh, itself decides to repaint the screen. This part here arguably should be, this part has got nothing to do with React. This is what the browser does. What React does is all of this stuff here. You know, you, you kind of don't really need to worry about the virtual DOM. It's there for a reason. It's there to take certain responsibilities uh, off your table, so to speak. Uh, but it's good to know what's kind of happening behind the scenes, I think. So uh, this is a summary now of not only this lecture, but the two previous lectures when we started on this set of slides here. So it's all about stateful components and stateless components. Uh, it's all about side effects, in particular, the side effects um, related to making API calls, but there are other types of side effects as well. Uh, and the side effects typically result in 
state change. And it's also important that you understand when a side effect uh, is executed. You know, uh, I talked my way through that the last day. We talked a little bit about data flow patterns as well. So um, that's that. There are some more hooks that we will cover later on. Uh, use data and use effect. Every app needs to utilize those hooks, and they are central to how React works. And it's very important, as I've already said many times, that you are comfortable uh, with using them. So I'm going to move on to the next section, which is here. I've just decided to break this up into uh, three sets of slides, just from an organization point of view, really. Um, in the first set, I just want to do go back to JavaScript and look at one or two other little aspects of the language that we haven't covered so far, but you will see me using them in, in the labs. And then we'll talk about something called routing or navigation. So far, our movies app, if you've completed last week's lab, is is static number one, but more importantly, it doesn't have doesn't allow you to navigate around different pages. And uh, we'll see how to do that, and also talk a little bit more about the whole area of design. So let's look at this set of slides first. There's only three or four slides in it. Or oh, sorry, before I do that, I, again, obviously there's an archive um, that you download and unzip. So. Uh, there's some little bits about JavaScript that we need to be aware of. Sorry, okay, um, so I'm just calling this my ES6 top up set of slides. And there are samples in the archive that I will just briefly look at. There's two things in particular I want to talk about. One is something is called destructuring, uh, which we've already seen actually, but I want to elaborate on it. Uh, the spread operator, which we haven't seen, but you'll see it used a lot in the labs. The third topic there isn't really that important. I just included it for the sake of completeness, but I don't think I use default arguments anywhere. So destructuring is the first topic. This was again introduced in ES6. And I'm saying it's about assigning the properties of an array or object. Arrays or objects, by the way, are collection data structures. So destructuring is about assigning elements of these collection data structures to individual variables. Uh, using a destruct, sorry, using a declarative style rather than a imperative style. Here's that. There's that word again, declarative. A lot of our programming is declarative in this module. So on the left there, you'll see uh, the old way of doing things. So I've declared an array with three elements, and then for whatever reason, I want to assign. Uh, individual elements of the array to, to specific variables. There is, our, the, let's say, pause, and there's a good reason why I want to do that. So this is the old way of doing it. This is a very much an imperative or procedural way of doing it. With destructuring, this is how we do it. Uh, here's my array on the right. And I'm, this, this is doing three, two things. It's declaring three variables. And because I've wrapped them in the square brackets, it effectively means take the first variable and assign it to the first value in, the, in this array. Take this variable and assign it the second value in this array, and this the third one. So it's doing the same as these three lines here, but it's doing it arguably in a more succinct and, uh, as we would say at the top, a more declarative way. The net effect of both of these is the exact same. I now have three variables, v1, v2, v3, and they have the values 10, 11, 12 in them. We saw this, if you remember, when I was invoking the use state hook. The use state hook returned an array, uh, and we use this destructuring syntax. That's what we call this now. Uh, we use the destructuring syntax there. We can do the same with objects. Uh, so here we have our object on the right, p-value pairs. 
uh, if I want to, in the old way, if I want to declare variables and assign them to particular uh, values from my array, from my object, sorry, this is how I would do it. But now I can do it in a declarative way. Note I'm wrapping uh, using curly braces here. So the curly braces indicates that the thing to the right of the equals is an object as opposed to an array. And again, what it's doing this time is it's declaring, this is declaring a variable called alpha. It's finding a key inside this object with that name, alpha. And it assigns to my alpha variable whatever value is assigned to the alpha key in this object. Similarly for beta. So these two names here have to match the names of the keys in your object. But what we are actually doing here is just declaring two local variables called alpha and beta. Uh, now, there's some other examples, though, where these things become useful uh, in the archive. So when you grab the archive and unzip it, you will find um, the following. So if I take this one here and just bring it into VS Code. Now to run these, uh, you need just type node, whatever the name of the script is. So there's no server uh, involved here now at all. And that's what the script returns. So if we look at the, very quickly, if we look at the contents of that file, uh, here it is here. So I've just got a whole series of examples. Uh, we've kind of seen this one already. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've seen that, that's okay. We have seen this one, that's okay. Uh, what's going on here? Oh yeah, that's okay. So pick up the story here maybe. So we've got this object with keys alpha, beta. Um, mm -mm -mm. There's a new there, it's all right. No, sorry, no. Oh yeah, let's, sorry, let's go back a little bit. Sorry, no. Yeah, let's look at this one here, right? Uh, this is in relation to arrays, obviously. So I've got this array. So maybe all I'm interested in is uh, the second and the fifth entry in the array. So you can do this kind of stuff here of comma, 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 telling it which ones to skip over. So the effect of this line is to declare two, I'm sure you've worked it out now, to declare two variables, V2 and V5. V2 should be assigned to the second element in my array, index one, okay? V5 should be assigned to the fifth element in the array, index four. And you can confirm when you do a console.log um, of V1 and V5, you will see that there'll be assigned 11 and 14, I think. So what we got down here, yeah. Sorry, Sorry Jamit, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, you know the way you're putting commas to skip elements. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what if I want to assign two elements that are uh, right beside each other? Uh, uh, should I just, also put a comma? Yeah, you just, uh, if I'm interested in, let's say here, V4, just like that. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, thought, but like, I thought a comma would skip uh, an element. Uh, no, I mean, it's not skipping any element up here. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's not skipping an element. It's, it's when you have two commas, I guess, let's say, if you've got two commas, then that's skipping an element. And then there's the kind of edge cases. If you've got a comma at the very beginning, then you're implying that you're skipping the first one. So the only place I'm skipping here is those two commas. I'm not skipping here. You'll notice as well like that, okay, I'm saying V4 and V5, 
yeah, yeah. The, there's actually another element at the end here but because you you know if you want to you could put a you could put a comma sorry now i've lost myself there for a second Oh yeah, uh, like if you want to, you could put, put a comma here as well, but you don't have to. Uh, once it once it gets to the closing square brackets, essentially, kind of it doesn't care if there are other elements in the array above. But the, but your the direct answer to your question is is as I'm showing you here. A comma just separates elements. Let's say if you've got two commas, then you're definitely skipping. If you've got two commas, you're skipping one element. If you've got three commas. You're skipping two elements, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. Um, in relation to objects, which is where we see it being used more so in the labs. Uh, so we've seen this example. We've seen this. You know, um, so there's proper restructuring going on here. There's no destructuring going on here. If I move on to this one. Oh yeah, the difference here is supposing I don't want to uh, name my variables based on the keys. Up here, I am declaring my two new variables, but the variables uh, are matching the names of the keys in the object. But supposing I, I want the variables to have a different name, then this is how you do it here. So what this is saying is find the key alpha in the object, get its value, and declare a new variable, but call the new variable that, and assign it whatever the value uh, from the object is. Similarly here, find the key beta, get the value of uh, associated with that key, uh, but declare a new variable called word, and assign to that variable uh, the value that you got out of the object. Uh, in this example, uh, in this example, I'm not interested in all of the elements in the object. You can see here there are three elements in the object, but it looks like I'm only interested in the foo element and the beta. I'm not interested in the alpha. And as well, there's no uh, there's no need. You can see that the foo is appearing before beta here, but the foo is appearing after beta in the actual object. There's no sense of the order of the elements in an object. Order is very important in arrays, but order has no significance when it comes to objects. Uh, that's the second point. But the other point is in your destructuring, that the destructuring that you're doing, you may only be interested in a subset of the entries in the actual object. And that is the case here. I'm only interested in two of them. And it's even more extreme down here. I'm only interested in one of them. Uh, again, I'm going back to the old way of, I want to declare my variable foo and assign it whatever value is assigned to the matching key. If I want to rename it, then I do it like this. Again, just play around with it if you're, if you're a little unclear on it. So that's destructuring, essentially deconstructing a collection uh, object into its individual parts. That's destructuring. Next is the spread operator. The spread operator is this triple dot operator. First of all, I'm just declaring something here. I'm saying JavaScript arrays and objects, uh, we refer to them as iterable, iterables in our, in our language. And iterable is something that you can, uh, surprise, surprise, iterate over. So the JavaScript only has two iterables, arrays and objects. And where the spread operator comes in is, if you want to, uh, I'm saying the spread operator allows you to uh, iterate Sorry, it allows an iterable 
to expand into places where zero or more arguments are expected. Uh, English never really makes anything clearer, arguably in this case, but uh, the way the syntactically, the way we use the triple dot operator is you just position it immediately in front of your iterable. And essentially what the spread operator does is this expression is spread out into the individual elements of the, the iterable structure. So in the, in the case of the array, the net effect of this expression when it's evaluated is the individual elements get enumerated uh, wherever, wherever that actually appears in a larger expression. This tends to appear in the middle of a larger expression. Let's look at some examples, which should make it clearer. Can you run it the same way as before? Okay, uh, I've got a function, it expects two, three arguments. Here I've got an array with three elements and I can actually call the function like this. So I'm using the spread operator in front of my array. And so what that will do is it will take the array elements and effectively convert this into my function square brackets, uh, 10 comma one comma, sorry, zero comma one comma two. Okay, it'll change it into my function. Zero, comma one, comma two, uh, which is what the function expects. Uh, that's one use case for us. Uh, you don't see it actually being used, spread operator being used that much in that uh, use case. Here are some more common use cases. So again, I've got a simple array. And supposing I have an expression like, like this. Now, the net effect of that assignment statement is my new array called ARR, it's going to have the element one, the element two. The next element is going to be an array. It's essentially going to take that entire array and just stick it in there and the next element is going to be five. Now, maybe that's what you want, but more than likely what you want is you want the individual elements of the mid array to be spread out inside this larger array. So when I do the console.log, first of all, of R there, then what we see is What we see is that, and you can see the actual array is inserted as an element. Really, probably what we want, arguably, is that. So how do I get that resulting in my array? Well, I use the spread operator as I've done here. Next example, again, I've got an array uh, oh yeah, if you want to make a copy of an array, then clearly that's not going to make a copy of my array. That's just going to declare a new variable called R2 and point it at the exact same array that R1 is pointing at. So if I carry out a push operation on R2 and then I do a console log of R1, I will see the effect of the push operation on my R1 array because R1 and R2 are pointing at the exact same array. So what I'm saying is that that has not made a copy of the array. If I want to make a copy of the array, I can use the spread operator to do that. The effect of this line is to create a completely new array, take the individual elements from R1 and put them into this new array. And I'm proving that to myself then by pushing something onto R2 when I do a console.log of R1, I'll see that the push operation 
uh, hasn't had any effect on R1 at all. And you can go back and look at that yourselves. Uh, if you have a string and you want to create an array consisting of the elements of the string, that's another use case for the triple dot operator. We don't see that used that much either, to be honest. Uh, moving on to objects, which is where I tend to use the spread operator, or you will see me using the spread operator uh, more often. So by way of illustration, I've got this object which contains some key value pairs related to me. And I've got this object, which contains uh, hopefully all of my attributes. Now, you see here, I've inserted the object just above me, just above the line there. I've inserted it into this larger object, but I've done it uh, by just directly inserting a reference to the object. Now, when I do it like that, then when I do a console.log of all me, what you see down here is, uh, you see this here. So it's actually created a key called part of me and the value of that key is an object. Now, maybe that's what I wanted, but uh, let's supposing my objective was to take the individual key value pairs in part of me and spread them out inside in the larger object, the all of me object. And the way I would do that is by sticking my spread operator in front of the part of me or the smaller object. And by doing that, when I now do a console.log, I get this down here. So contrast this with this. Okay, so it's actually taken the first name and uh, surname and actually spread them out inside in the larger object. Any questions about that? Another example where the spread operator can be useful. So again, I've got an object here and I want to update one of the keys in the object. So you can see one of the keys in my object is the address key. But in this assignment statement here, I'm taking the me object, spreading out its individual key value pairs. One of the keys in the me object is called address. But I'm actually adding another entry into this new object that I'm creating, which also has the key address and giving it that value. And the effect of this here is essentially to overwrite the value that was assigned to address up here. It doesn't overwrite it now in the me object. The me object is unaffected. But this new object that I'm creating, uh, it's, it's going to have an address value equal to this. Uh, because, because this one appears after this one in the declaration of the updated me, then the second one is the one that takes effect. So the net effect is of this is to update one of the keys in my, uh, in this case, in my me object, updated though within this completely new object. As I said, the me object is not affected at all by this statement here. When I do a console.log of the updated me, then indeed, the address is uh, 2 Main Street. Right, so uh, um, that's the spread operator. You can actually use, I'm using the spread operator there always on the right-hand side of an assignment statement. You can actually use it on the left-hand side as well. Uh, and we will see that much later on and I'll explain it when uh, it arises. The default arguments, uh, you can look at that example yourself. It's, it's just the ability to assign default values to function arguments if none is explicitly given to them uh, when, when they're invoked. So you can look at that example yourself. So that's our very quick uh, ES6 top up explained, hopefully. And I want to move on to this set of slides here.
So we want to talk about the ability to add navigation or routing uh, or routing, depending on which side of the Atlantic you live, uh, to our app. And routing or navigation is, you know, where we click on a link uh, in our view, and that brings us uh, notionally to a new page within our app. So we're navigating from page to page or from view to view, because we now know that really there aren't multiple pages at all in a React app, but what actually happens is a whole set of components get unmounted and a new set get mounted. And the, the visual effect is, is as if we are moving to a new page and as well, the browser's URL changes. Uh, so that kind of confirms to us that we get this impression that we're moving from one page to another page within our app. The React framework doesn't support navigation at all. We need a third party library to do that. There are a couple of them. The most popular one is one called the React Router Library, and that's the one that we'll use. So it's about allowing multiple views or pages in an app. And very importantly, it's about keeping the URL in sync with the UI. So it, it's, it, you kind of get the impression that it's a static app and we're just moving from one web page to another web page. It's that kind of familiar experience. And that that's the idea of keeping the URL uh, changing as the user navigates around the app. That's a very important core kind of principle of the web itself. It's one of these traditional principles, which I've mentioned before, this addressability principle. Addressability, as you, you might recall, if we think about the static web world, when we move from one web page to another web page, each web page has its own unique address. And the advantage of that is that I can just send you the unique address for a particular web page and you will go straight to it. Your browser will take you straight to that page. You don't have to kind of go to some base page and then follow some series of links in order to get to the page that I want you to see. That's this idea of addressability. It's also kind of referred to or linked to information sharing or deep linking. We want the same kind of uh, experience in a React app. So if I've got a React app and it's hosted on some cloud service and there's a particular view within the app that I want to share with you, I don't have to tell you, well, go to the home page and then follow this procedure in order to get to the particular view that I want you to see. I can just give you the views full URL and you'd be taken straight to it. Uh, 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 Web-based apps have been around for quite a long while, as, as you know, but in the earlier incarnations of web-based apps, they did not support this addressability characteristic. They did have this notion of multiple views, but the browser's URL never changed. And so it meant that they didn't support, they did not support the addressability. Uh, quality. So, uh, but React does, and uh, all single page apps arguably do now. So how do we use this React router third party library with uh, our React app or inside our React app? Uh, again, there's a whole series of samples as usual, and I'm only going to cover some of the samples with this set of slides. The other samples will be covered later on. And the reason I'm breaking it up in that way is I want to cover the samples as we need them in the movies app. So you'll get the samples from the archive, uh, the same archive. This, this archive had the uh, ES6 top up samples that I was looking at there, but it also has these routing samples and uh, you download it, unzip it, run npm install. There was no npm install now for the ES6 top-up stuff that I was just looking at. And sorry, now, so if I bring in the archive, so here it is here.
a whole series of samples and you, you run npm start it's, it's it was created with the create react app tool so And the way you step through the samples is you first of all, for each one, you first of all have to go to the index.js at the very top of this folder structure that only has one line and it just refers to a particular sample. So by simply changing that, so if I want to look at sample three for whatever reason, just change that, save it and create React app does its live reload and we're now looking at sample three. Okay, that's how you're meant to utilize this particular archive. So where are we time-wise? I guess I have to halt it really. I don't want to rush through this either. So I'm going to halt it there and we we'll pick up the story uh, next week. You will need uh, you will need routing for this week's lab, I think. Is that right? Yeah, there's a tiny bit of routing in this week's lab, but I'll, I'll, have, I'll have the slides covered by Thursday anyway, Thursday and Friday. So, okay, uh, that's it. I guess we leave it there unless there are any closing questions.